Hi, I'm Pilgrim Beard, a device pilot, and today I'm very pleased to welcome Martin Davies, Chairman of Viridian Solar. Hello, Martin. Hi there, Pilgrim. So uh, we're going to talk about solar panels today, and it's fantastic. I was just looking up the learning curves for, for, for solar panels. The, the cost, I think, has fallen by something like 20% per year on a compound basis, which means that over the last 10 years, the costs have fallen by 80%, uh, something like that per kilowatt which is, uh, it's not many things in life that have, have achieved that. So, um, you know, we still seem to be on an epic adventure, really, when it, when it comes to solar PV. And it's one that you've been very uh, seminal in, in being involved in. Um, so if my memory is correct, back in about 2003, I believe that you and your colleagues uh, started off by painting a radiator black and, and doing some experiments with that. C could you just tell us a little bit about the, the founding of Viridian and how it led to today? Well, that's, that's right, Sir Pilgrim, like all good solar companies, you start in your garden painting radiators black um, to, to try and get a feel for what, uh, what is a slightly different technology, of course, to the modern photovoltaic panels, which is solar thermal, the much simpler process of just capturing heat and then storing that heat in your hot water cylinder for use later when, when you need some, some hot water. And that's exactly where we started, because if you go back then, it's before the big decreases in the costs of PV that you've just been describing there, which is pretty accurate as to what's happened. So, so back then, PV is very expensive, and it made far more sense to be, to be pursuing solar thermal as a means of capturing lovely free daylight uh, and being able to do something beneficial in the house. And back in 2003, uh, a colleague and I who worked in our previous company together, we were looking for what to do next uh, as a company. And we thought that evidently uh, resource utilization, sustainability, energy, and so on, that was a, a trend that we'd identified as being a, a one that was coming our way. And it's one that we felt very easy to get motivated about. And we thought we were quite good engineers so we could engineer decent products in that space. And, uh, and that's what we did. So we, we kicked off by going and talking to house builders because we knew nothing at that time about our chosen market of uh, providing solar products to house builders. Uh, so we had to go and talk to the house builders and try and understand what the world looked like from their point of view. And it was really quite interesting how open they were to us and how engaged they were. And they also recognised that this was coming down the line and it was probably something they were going to have to be doing, either because customers were asking for it or because planners were going to be asking for it or building control was going to force them to, to start adopting these kinds of technologies in new buildings. And therefore, they were quite excited to be able to engage with someone who was going to provide them with a piece of piece of equipment they could use so that they could help shape it, give us the, the an idea of how it would work and fit into their build program, the kind of cost they, they were going to look to incur for that kind of thing and find it acceptable, all that kind of game. And it was and it was really great. So off, off we went and we designed our first solar thermal panel uh, specifically for the new build sector. So the rules are kind of slightly different. You can, you can put it on a, a house and on a roof while the house is being built, not after it's been built. And that changes the way you can solve some of the engineering problems to make it stay on the roof, integrate it into the house, make the plumbing connections and the electronic connections and so on and so forth. And, uh, and, and off we went and it, and it all went very, very well. And I remember <laughs> visiting your, your, uh, your facilities not long after that, and it was full of wonderful, you know, big panels being engineered and manufactured and moved around in this great big sort of warehouse operation. I mean, it's proper, proper real physical engineering. You don't see a lot of that in the UK, but it was really, really fun to see that. And that's one of the things that we've always enjoyed. You know, it's been one of our axioms, really. We want to make some real physical stuff. Um, it kind of cuts the grain across the grain, if you like, of some of the Cambridge companies that are very, very much about knowledge and about... Um, you know, uh, non-hardware solutions and, and what have you. But for us, that's quite important. We've got to get our hands dirty. So mm -hmm. absolutely right. We, we had some big machines and we had some big presses and lots of guys going around with boiler suits on and, um, and, and making real stuff and then boxing it up and selling it to people. It was uh, very exciting. So, so, what, so what then? Um, that, that was about well, initially, but then, then PV came into the mix. That's right. And, and we followed that transition as well. So, so once the prices of PV started to come down, as you, you've already mentioned, um, we were then being asked for uh, an equivalent product to our solar thermal panel, which was a PV panel. So we then started making some PV panels, which were a match to our solar thermal panel. So a, a physical size match could use a lot of the engineering technology that we we got right for the solar thermal panel to, to apply to the PV panel. And 
uh, then be able to offer both side by side. So if you need a bit of PV and you need a bit of solar thermal, they look the same. They sat by, side by side on the roof. They integrated in exactly the same way. They shared a lot of com common components. And that began to, to pick up and gain some traction um, with, with an extra string to our bow, if you like. But the, the really transformational thing that came was that uh, at about that time that we started moving into PV, first of all, the government decided to stimulate the PV market through the feed-in tariff. So a means of rewarding people for adopting PV and generating their own electricity. It wasn't specifically just PV, it was also about other renewable technologies such as small scale wind turbines and so on, but PV ended up being dominant there. Uh, so that was accelerating the adoption of, of PV, though largely in the retrofit market, which is not where we were, we were just into, into new build, but nevertheless, the, the whole market began to grow and, and everyone began to benefit from that and, and what goes on around it. It meant it was very frothy for quite a long time. So there were lots of, you know, every man and his dog became PV installer. They all very quickly went off and got certified because there was a, you know, a, a quality management scheme, if you like, for it, the MCS. So every man and his dog was doing that. Every product was MCS certified. So they were largely good installations, but an awful lot of froth going on. And, and at the same time as that came out, and it turned out to be a pretty generous scheme, the... Uh, price of PV started to come down, which is a global market. You know, it's a global commodity. So it's not something that, that we as a company drove. And it's not something that the UK drove in terms of reducing prices. It was a global thing. Uh, the, uh, the Chinese in particular became very adept at large scale manufacturing at very low cost of the raw silicon, the lamination plants and all of the various processes in, in making them. And lots of nations around the world, as well as the UK, saw this as a means of solving some of their future energy problems. Uh, so, so we then began to, to ride that wave and with prices coming down very rapidly with a generous feeding tariff, there was a huge amount of adoption, a massive bubble, if you like. So the government then realised that it didn't need to be quite so generous with its stimulus and began to withdraw the, the feeding tariff. To the point where nowadays there is no feeding tariff, the feeding tariff finished a few years ago now, by which time with the reduction in price of PV, uh, the solar thermal product effectively became redundant because for the same money that it would cost to build a solar thermal product, you could buy some PV products and plug them into an immersion heater, which every water cylinder has sitting at the bottom of it anyway. So, so the solar, solar thermal product kind of, kind of withered on the vine. And with that, unfortunately, the large portion of our manufacturing operation in the UK mm -hmm. also just shrank. And in the end, we stopped doing our manufacturing of solar thermal in 2017, so five years ago now. Uh, and since then, we've been exclusively uh, a PV company. Uh, and that has continued to, to grow, which has been great. Great. So, I mean, in terms of costs, I can see that the, the sort of material costs and the component costs have been falling sharply, but presumably installation costs have been fixed or even rising um, because of the manual element. I mean, is, is that why you've uh, focused on building integrated so that you can sort of amortize the the labor that's up there anyway, putting tiles on roofs and, and so on. I mean, is that, is that the logic behind that? Um, really the logic for going to, to New Build was recognition that this was something that New Build was gonna to have to adopt. And that when large house builders um, uh, start to adopt that kind of thing, they, they have a bit of inertia about them, but once you've got them going and once you've got them realizing that actually it's pretty straightforward, it's fairly low risk, then once it's in, it's probably in for good. And the direction of travel of building regulation is really only in one direction. It will be driving lower and lower energy consumptions, lower carbon footprints for, for dwellings, um, and, and obviously better fabric and all the other bits as well. Uh, but once you move in that direction, you know which direction it's gonna go in. So not surprisingly, every time there's a change in building regulation, the rules get a bit stiffer, the targets get a bit higher. And that generally means that you have to adopt a bit more PV on your roof. And, and the old days when we first started, we were only having one or two panels on the roof, which is really rather silly. Uh, it's now half a dozen panels. It's now actually quite a significant array. I was going to ask about that, actually, because I do. I mean, as soon as you have solar PV yourself, you look for it everywhere. And, uh, um, and, and thanks to your kind of technology, it actually is becoming harder to spot now because it's uh, better integrated with the building. Um, but even so, I can't help but notice that a lot of modern builds still seem to have remarkably small amounts of PV. As you say, they'll have one or two panels. And I kind of think, well, for the effort and cost, surely it's, I just cover the roof in panels. Why not? Sort of thing. Um, and, and especially now that energy prices are rising so sharply because of events we all know about, um, if it almost feels like beyond the regulatory requirements and the box ticking that the builder might want to do, 
Um, I mean, it, I just, you know, on consumer programs and so many things that people are now talking, uh, you know, the guy that delivers me fish every week was talking the other day about solar panels and heat pumps to me. I mean, it's, 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 the, it's the zeitgeist and people seem to now really be interested in to understand the economics of it and think of it as an investment. And if you've got, you know, 10K sitting in a bank account, it might actually be a useful way to spend that money over, you know, um, a, a certain time frame. So, you know, do you, do you think do you think there might be a driver to the point where people will start to really maximise the amount of PV on their roofs? I, I, th I think that might come, Pilgrim. It's not absolutely clear that it will, because the the house building industry has a little bit of decoupling. In and, and what I mean by that is that the pe the company making the house is never going to occupy the house, and their business model is very much focused around that. What they do is they identify sites. They go through all the regulatory stuff, they get the planning permission, they build the houses, they maximise value out of the plots that they've got for the benefit of their shareholders. It's what they have to do as a company, and they're very, very good at that. Uh, and they do that by recognising also what is it that people want and, of course, what can people afford as well. Mm -hmm. and, and when you do those, those calculations, which they're doing all the time, uh, it, it, it does have an element of pull about it. So there, there will be potential customers who are asking, we'll just what is it going to cost me to run this house after I buy it? Mm. But actually, it's surprising how far down the list that is. When somebody's spending very large amounts of money on a dwelling, they're far more interested in just making sure that, you know, they, they, they're not overpaying for their property and that they can afford the mortgages, all this kind of stuff. And, and where the running, running costs come of, of occupying that dwelling is actually quite a long way down their list. But having said that, of course, that's something which has been changing over the time over time as just the general trend of energy prices going up and the general awareness of, of, of sustainability and energy consumption and where we get our energy from and carbon footprint and so on. But of course, just in the last year or so, it's become very, very much in, of, of an interest to most people. So for those who already have their properties, I'm sure if they've got a bit of savings in their account, earning them not a lot of return of you know interest return on their deposits. They might be looking at it saying, do you know what? We'll be better off going and buying ourselves, covering our roof with PV, off reducing our energy consumption or, or you know, changing our glazing or putting some insula more insulation in the loft, wherever it needs to be. So fabric improvements and design improvements to the house. And of course, the other thing of flavor of the month at the moment is, is heat pumps. Um, mm -hmm. and, and actually accelerating the adoption of those. And, and that might end up also then being a pull for the new house builders. Yeah, uh, date though that hasn't really happened that way. So, so they have yeah. very much just kind of followed what they needed to do to comply with building regulations, and very few of them have done much more than that. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I suppose there's a bit of a chicken and egg, really, isn't there, in terms of what's available on the market and whether consumers therefore use that as a criterion for, for selecting a home. Yeah, so you, sort of, I'd like to finish off perhaps by just asking you to think ahead a little bit. Maybe five years is a good time time range. Um, PV is a standalone technology, um, it, uh, but it's also a kind of gateway drug, I think. PV and EV are probably a couple of the kind of gateway drugs that get people into thinking about the actual cost of energy and, and make it sort of makes it more sort of visible in various ways. Um, the, so are there other technologies that you see coming that, that will kind of perhaps interact with PV in, in some way? It, Sort of from a cost effectiveness point of view or from a technology point of view you know you mentioned heat pumps obviously if you've got some electricity and you want to turn it into heat a heat pump is three times better than an immersion heater from that point of view um uh but i mean a heat pump requires a lot of uh, power doesn't it um so i don't know i don't know if pv is significant in powering heat pumps in the winter or not um but uh you know what, what sort of innovations do you see happening but also kind of the the instrumentation of these things, it feels like a lot of these things that are coming along, they're not just new ways of using energy and renewable energy, but they, they're also smart, a bit, they're a bit more intelligent. So perhaps to help the user actually see what's going on, to help them manage, to help automate things. I mean, certainly in my house, it feels like I'm, I'm buying point solutions to individual things, but they don't necessarily interact with each other very many, very, very well. You know, I'm, I'm almost losing track of the number of current clamps in my meter cabinet. <laughs> so, so uh, you know, yeah, just to be really interested in your view about what, you know, what, what do you think is going to happen in the next five years around PV or and including yeah. the PV? Yeah. Itself. Well, I think, I think your question has exposed a lot of the things which are, are probably going to be happening at some point in the not too distant future. Uh, so, uh, you know, more PV on houses, 
um, those those PV systems are already have embedded in them a reasonable amount of smarts. It's not in the panel, it's in the inverter, the thing that couples the, the panels to your household supply. Most of those inverters have a capability to talk to other devices and exchange information about how much energy is being produced and, and so on. Um, we have current clamps to identify whether we're importing or exporting electricity. We have heat pumps. We have uh, smart hot water cylinders, uh, which can choose when to, to heat the hot water and when not to heat hot water. And they are also now quite um, ambivalent about where the energy source is, whether it's a gas boiler, a heat pump, or just direct electric. They, they don't really mind. They can balance that up. Mm. Being internet connected, of course, is something which is very valuable because you then open yourself up to a whole bunch of um, uh, data sources and drivers from outside the building. So signals about uh, energy pricing. Uh, energy pricing is now very volatile and be increasingly volatile as we adopt more and more renewables and the intermittency that come with them. Uh, so all, all of that can can is really driving a convergence of a whole bunch of things. Now, I can't identify who the winners are going to be. If I, if I could, I wouldn't be wasting the time talking to you. I'd be down the stock exchange back in the winners, of course. But you can see the direction of travel is definitely towards cooperation between all of these devices. So within a household, being able to control where the energy is going to go. If you're generating it, do you want to sell it back to your utility company? Well, if they're offering a great price, yes. If they're not, well, don't. Stick it in your car instead or stick it in your hot water cylinder um, or your home battery system sitting on the walls. Uh, Bidirectional uh, charging of cars, of course, is now coming in. So not just the, the car sinking energy into its own batteries, but also giving the opportunity to the household to say, well, actually, you can have some of this back if you want, if you want to turn the lights on at night because electricity is currently very expensive. So have the stuff that you did earlier, which was really cheap because you did it with your solar panels, that kind of argument. So this home energy management stuff, lots of people are talking about it. Lots of people are getting ready for it. But at the moment, it still appears to me to be fairly early days. It's difficult to see how it's going to shake out. So a lot of people are just making themselves available. Some are making... Um, uh, are driving towards owning the, the space uh, and wanting to be the home energy management company. But there's so many of them, it's, it's quite difficult to see what's going to happen. It's a bit like the EV space. You know, yes, Tesla's very big, the mainstream car companies coming through. There's an awful lot of other electric vehicle companies out there, each picking their own niche. They can't all be winners. There's going to be some winners, there's going to be some losers. It's difficult to see quite how that's going to shake out. And of course, for the house builder, some of this is, is, is already mandated. We, we know that PV panels, they're not mandated, but they become a part of an optimal solution in terms of the cost and the benefit that they give to the, to the people in the dwelling. But also now, of course, there's rules about EV chargers. Mm. New houses have to have EV chargers on the wall. They will do very soon. And that's not surprising. You have to mandate that because we know the future of mobility is an electric one. So uh, th that's the kind of direction it's all going to be going in, uh, where exactly the winners and losers are going to be and where exactly it's going to end up landing. Um, I'm not bold enough to tell you at the moment, but we as a company are, you know, we're, we're getting ready for it. We, we can see it coming. Uh, we, can, we can be planning our own, own pathway for, for, for new products and so on and see how that complies. And, and knowing some of the guys with some of these, um, you know, Hot water cylinder companies are, is is also helping to inform some of that decision making. But also, you mentioned you know can you use it to drive your heat pump? But of course you could. Technically, you absolutely could. It's just that in the UK, uh, we end up with this sort of um, uh, out out of phase, if you like, between when we generate energy from a PV system, which is dominantly in the summer months um, and during the middle of the day, and when we need that energy particularly for space heating, which is where your heat pump comes in, they'll also do your domestic hot water. And that's mostly in the winter. Uh, and as a consequence, you get a big mismatch, which was always the issue from the early days, even the solar thermal. You know, you, you could always fill your hot water cylinder with hot water in the middle of summer. Yes, you still need hot water. In the middle of winter, not much really. You still need your gas boiler to, um, to, to fill the cylinder up ready for a bath. Yeah, well, the national grid won't be going away anytime soon then. Um, fantastic. No, no it won't. Um, but, and, and they will have increasing challenges, you know, so a lot of the demand side response stuff, which can happen in the dwelling, will be driven by all those external signals from the network operators, the energy producers, and so on and so forth. Yeah, great. Well, Martin, I can't thank you enough for the uh, erudition that, uh, that you've shown in take, taking us through this all. I mean, it's fantastic to speak to someone who I mean, it's you know, amazing to realise that your your journey of Iridian has now been going on for for nearly twenty years, which is a which is a long <laughs> journey, isn't it? But we all got time has flown by. Yes. 
<laughs> anyway, I really appreciate you taking your time today. It's been good talking. Experience. Thank you so much. You're welcome.